Well, good afternoon and good morning uh, to everyone. It's um, uh, great to have the opportunity to share with you today our fourth year of research uh, that was is going to be highlighting the shades of independence. And we're going to be talking about the future of work uh, in the 2014 MBO Partner State of Independence Study. And um, I am Gene Zeno, uh, President and CEO of MBO Partners. And with me today is uh, Steve, uh, Steve King and Carolyn Ockels, who is joining me from the West Coast in Silicon Valley. And I'm here in the DC area. So uh, we're pretty much covering the country today in the state of independence. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, for those of you that uh, might be new to uh, the GoToMeeting webinar, up in the right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a little uh, uh, dashboard, and you have the ability to make a full screen icon by pressing that little screen button there. If you want to chat and ask questions, which we encourage you to do, please uh, enter your questions into the little chat box. and. We will be answering them uh, either during the presentation or at the end. We'll try to get to all of them. If we don't, we'll uh, get to them uh, subsequently through either email or, or uh, we'll figure out another way of uh, posting a blog. Uh, we are going to be uh, tweeting this out today, so you can tweet as well. It's uh, uh, the hashtag MBOWeb, and please uh, participate in the conversation. We've got people ready to answer your questions, uh, as well as uh, participate in uh, comments during the uh, presentation. So with that, uh, for those of you that may not know MBO Partners, uh, we uh, have been around for a little bit, and we are very big advocates for the independent workforce. Uh, and you know, we recognize how difficult it is for people to administer a company in today's environment as an independent person while trying to build an independent uh, work career. And we've created a services back office that allows uh, individuals to basically outsource the administration of the business aspects of being an independent so that it's easier for them and their clients to work together. And as you can see, there's a number of uh, capabilities that our platform offers. And you get access to, to some very lucrative uh, uh, programs. Uh, executive style benefits uh, that pretty much rival uh, the uh, benefits offered by you know many of the of today's even large uh, Fortune 100 type companies, and as part of the MBO network, you're you're approved uh, to do work with thousands of organizations that we have in our network. So uh, you basically have an easier way to engage with uh, client organizations uh, if we're if they're not in our network. We we work on putting them in the network. So uh, that also makes it easier. And you kind of join a community of over 40,000 uh, independent professionals who, who are eager to uh, communicate with one another and help and so forth. So it gives you a little sense of what it is that MBO does. And, and um, with that, we're going to move into the main topic today. And I would like to introduce Steve King and Carolyn Ogles, who are partners of uh, emergent research. Uh, Steve and Carolyn, please uh, uh, introduce and say uh, say hello to the audience. Hello, and thanks for uh, having us, Gene. This is Steve. And this is Carolyn. Thanks for having us. And Steve and Carolyn have been working with us for, for uh, over the four years of research, and um, I'm so pleased and honored to have them uh, working on this report for MBO. Uh, and I think you'll you'll see that they are extremely talented and extremely knowledgeable in the entire new economy of uh, whether it's the uh, independent workforce or small business and, and, and sharing economy. And I'll let, I'll let Steve and Carolyn give a little bit of a background as to what it is that Emergent does. So before that, let me just share with you that we'll have um, uh, the fourth year of our research revealed to you today. And that's on top of the prior uh, three years, starting in 2011. And as you can see, from 2011 to 2014, we have had quite a number of increase in, uh, in, in the terms of numbers of independent workers in the United States. And uh, these surveys are um, accumulative over the years, uh, have surveyed over 11,000 people 
and uh, with then uh, phone interviews with hundreds of, of people. So the benefit of now having data for so many years, you really start to see patterns and could recognize patterns and you, and you get a very confident way of being able to understand the, uh, the, the, the trends and, and data. So I think you'll find this very interesting. And again, it is, it is one of the most uh, revered reports out in the marketplace uh, today that speaks to the independent workers in America. So with that, I'm going to give this to Steve and Carolyn. And um, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, we'll be monitoring them and, and try to inject them during the presentation. So Steve and Carolyn, please uh, take it from here. OK, thank you, Gene. Um, as Gene mentioned, we're Emergent Research. We're a research and consulting firm focused on the intersection of the uh, small business economy and the future of work. And our, one of our main areas of specialization is understanding independent workers, the folks that uh, are working on their own in alternative work arrangements. And as uh, I wanted to start by defining a few terms that we'll be using today um, so we understand them a little better. And we consider independent workers anybody who has a non-traditional work arrangement, including folks that are self-employed and temps and independent contractors, all the way up to micro-business owners, people that own businesses with employees, but fewer than four employees. And so we're looking at that as the universe that we study. Um, one of the things that's important to point out in our work, we look at people who do this on a regular basis. And so in our surveys, we're asking them, do you do this in an average work week? Um, we're trying to get at the people that are that are serious about their alternative work relationship and serious about being an independent worker. And within that, we're going to talk about two broad areas today. Um, and, and one is what we call the solopreneurs. And these are the independent workers that work more than 15 hours per week in an average work week. And so these are the folks that, that are serious about this. It's part of their regular routine and, and their regular jobs. And in fact, the majority of these people are full-time, um, working more than 35 hours a week. And many, of course, work many more hours than 35 hours a week. And so you can consider these the full-timers or the near full-timers in some cases, um, but people that are doing it every day and earning their living from independent work. The second group that we're going to talk about are the side giggers. And the side giggers are people who, again, work regularly as an independent worker, but they work less than 15 hours a week. And so these are really the part-timers that are out there um, doing independent work, but doing it part-time. And, and we'll talk more about them a little, little later. Um, one of the things that's come out of our work over the last four years, and the reason this year's report was called the Shades of Independence, is that there is no one-size-fit-all independent worker. There are many segments of, of independent workers, many types of independent workers. And we're going to talk more broadly about the, the two big groups, the solopreneurs and the side giggers, but we'll also go a little deeper later on into some of the other segments. Um, but a key, key learning from this research is there's lots of different types of independent workers. In the popular press, we tend tends to just describe them all as one thing. And of course, that's not entirely true. So there's a, a real mix, and we'll get to that later. Um, next slide, please. So as Gene mentioned, the, the numbers have grown um, quite a bit over time. And what we're looking at with the solopreneurs, and again, those are the folks working 15 plus hours, we've seen them go from roughly 15.9 million um, up to 17.9 over the last four years. It's really interesting. That's about a 12.5% growth rate over that time period. And when you compare that with the overall workforce, the overall workforce grew only about 1.1% during that time frame. So what we're seeing is that the independent workforce is growing at a much faster rate than our overall workforce. And of course, gaining share, a higher percentage of people are becoming independent workers. And to us, what's, as researchers, what's really interesting about this time frame is the, um, it happened during an economic recovery. Now, it's not been a strong economic recovery by traditional standards, but it's still been a, a pretty good economic recovery. And the, the recession actually ended over five years ago. And historically, what happens during economic recoveries is self-employment either stabilizes or falls um, as jobs pick up and the opportunities for jobs pick up. And we didn't see this in this recovery. And it's a, it's a real reason why we believe this is a structural shift. 
even with the strong job market of the last year, we did see the independent workforce continue to grow. It was modest growth from 2013 to 2014, but it did grow. Now, in past years, we only studied the solopreneurs. This, this year, we added the side giggers, the part-timers, so we don't have the historical data on them as much, but we did see that there are quite a few of them, 12.1 million in 2014. And so across 2014, there's about 30 million people that are, um, that are employed in, uh, as independent workers. Um, we're, we're forecasting this to continue, a growth rate of about 6% a year. We're actually forecasting the, uh, the growth of the independent workforce to, to be faster than it's been over the last four or five years, and we'll go into that in a little more detail later in the presentation. But at a fundamental level, the important thing here is it's a large group of people and it's a growing group of people. And I just wanted to cover real quickly age cohorts. Um, it's, it's pretty consistent across all ages. For us, seniors are uh, people that are 67 and older. Um, the other age groups are, are, are pretty common. And so what you're seeing is it is popular amongst all age groups. It's male, female. It's diverse in terms of participation by minorities. And so independent work is consistent across the economy. It's, it's also, when you look underneath at industries, job types, um, pretty much every sector of the economy and every demographic group is participating in the independent workforce. Next, please. At a broad level, we wanted to talk about the solopreneurs versus the side giggers. And I think there's a couple of important things to think about when we start to segment these guys. The solopreneurs are primarily looking for autonomy, control, and flexibility in their work. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, you, you see that over and over again when we talk to people, when we interview people, when we do focus groups with this group. Those are the attributes they're looking for when they become an independent worker. And, and very consistently we hear, that's what I want to do and that's why I like it. The, solo, the side giggers who are part-timers are, are, are much more focused on income, and, and that, that makes perfectly good sense. If you actually look at the side giggers, about 60% of them have either a full or part-time job. And so you get much more of a focus on, I want to supplement my income, I want to earn more, I want to get prepared for retirement or supplement my actual retirement. And it's interesting when you look at the, the numbers on supplement retirement, obviously the older folks, um, particularly the matures and seniors in this group, they're the group that, that overwhelmingly say they're doing it to supplement their retirement. But it's interesting with the side giggers, it's not just about money. Um, we see a, we're seeing two, two trends that, that we've identified elsewhere that we're starting to see show up more and more in the data in terms of survey results. And one is that they're using these side gigs, the less than 15 hours, they're doing that to explore alternatives and new careers. Um, we see that with about one in eight cent telling us that's what they're doing. They're looking at potentially starting a new business or shifting careers. And the other one that's interesting to us is about 12% tell us that they see the side gig as a lifeboat. Um, we ask it in a different way we don't ask specifically, do you have a lifeboat? But the concept is, with the economic uncertainty that exists out there, people are trying to make sure that if they lose their primary source of income, they have a backup. And so we're, it's a really interesting trend to see people choose to start side businesses because they are cons very much concerned about losing their traditional job, even though, as we've said, the economy is recovering, has recovered, job market's pretty strong right now. So. So interesting groups, but when you start to think about this, the solopreneurs are really into this as a career. They're into it because they want to be doing this, whereas the side giggers are often doing this out of income. Um, both groups uh, do are, are fairly satisfied or highly satisfied with this, um, with being independent, um, but they're a little different. And with that, let me ask Carolyn to step in as we go to the next slide. All right. So we've, we've tried to map out satisfaction over the past four years, and uh, what we're, we're trying to understand how people are really feeling about uh, working as an independent. And we've been surprised at the consistency, but uh, independents are very satisfied with this work style. And uh, if you look at the slide, you'll see that 63%, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of fluctuating between 60 and 70% over the last four years. Um, it was a little bit higher in 2012, which was sort of the, 
peak of unemployment, and people were very happy to have another way to earn money, I think. Uh, very grateful for independence as, a, as an alternative work style. But, uh, but in spite of the, uh, the, the job recovery, we're seeing people still holding on to independence as, as a very um, satisfying way of working. Uh, You'll, we, we've graphed here uh, 8 out of 10 on a scale of, of uh, 1 to 10 on satisfaction. If you actually add in 7, which uh, many of us consider a, a pretty good rating on a satisfaction scale, it jumps up dramatically up to 82% uh, satisfaction. So we're really looking at very robust numbers here. Uh, one of the things that we found that's interesting is that uh, satisfaction increases with experience. And so if we start looking at cohortal differences, um, looking generation specific, it's actually the, uh, the, those who have more experience will be, will be happier with this work style. So the young Gen Yers, for example, who are just into the job market, um, while they like the concept of it, they find uh, they, they don't rate quite as high on satisfaction because they don't have as much experience to bring to the table and they don't necessarily have the professional network to make independent work um, easier to um, easier to, uh, to to work out for them. Uh, okay, next slide. Now, we're also uh, looking at why people are choosing independent work, and there's an awful lot of uh, press that that focuses on the, the necessity preneurs, as we call them, those who turn to it out of need. And interestingly enough, when we really started talking to people, we found that that wasn't the case at all, that there's, there are clearly people that are turning to independent work uh, out of need, but it's, it's only 13% and um, that, that look at it only as their only option. Um, we have 53% reporting that, um, that they're completely choosing this path. They're tired of working for people or they're, they might have dealt with some negative side of work and then uh, chose to um, chose an alternative path. They might have wanted to pursue a passion. Uh, they found a good opportunity or they wanted to be their own boss. But they're really picking up on this path and running with it. Uh, if we look at, at um, the group that, uh, that is, um, says that there are some factors that came in, maybe there was downsizing at a firm, and they just have it, we've had it working for a corporate, um, in a corporate environment. So choice came into play when they were choosing their next options. And those are the 34% here. So we're looking at, um, at a, you know, at uh, 80, let's see, well, well over 87% um, here that say that choice played a role. I'd just like to add that um, we put in 2014 and 2011 data just to fit in the slide because pie charts get confusing as we add more, we would have too much pie. <laughs> so if we look at 2012 and 2013, the data is very consistent across all four years. Right, and that's, that's the other thing that we're saying. Again, it, it can be a boring story, but sometimes boring with data is the most compelling because we're finding that there is a very clear snapshot here that is holding up to time. Okay, next slide. Now we've done quite a bit of digging on the attitudes about independent work, trying to understand why people are choosing this, and you know, given given the satisfaction rates, what are they finding about it that um, that they that they like or they don't like? Um, and really, it boils down to uh, uh, the fact that independence, while they're while many of them are, are very good earners, independence is more about meaningful work and control over one's life than the money itself. Um, we find that passion, purpose, autonomy, flexibility, and control all come into play when you ask people about their attitudes toward work. Um, oh, you know, passion, over 70% say that they, uh, that they um, do what they do because it, that, that it's more important to do what they like than, um, than money itself. Uh, they want to make a difference with the world, and, um, and they want to be their own boss. Next slide. Now, the motiv motivations um, behind becoming independent are, um, are pretty much consistent with what we saw in the attitudes. It, it boils down to flexibility, autonomy, and control. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, half of the respondents reported a desire for work-life flexibility. 
close to a third want to be their own boss. One out of four left jobs they were unhappy with to improve how they worked. So it's interesting. There, we, we do have 15% you know, reporting an inability to find employment when entering the job market. And, um, and that's, that's a significant number. Uh, you know, it's one in seven. But I think that that's a very different number than what we're hearing about in the, in the general press. And, and it's important for us to understand that, that it's not just a need that's driving people to independence. It's really a, a work-life choice and that people are looking for ways to integrate work and life together, not just to, um, to balance them out. And, I, and I, I'd add, when you look at the loss of job due to layoff, termination, or closure, you see it's about one in five across the whole pool. The interesting piece, the two groups that got that, that respond much higher and, and got hurt most during the recession, interestingly enough, are older baby boomers and uh, younger millennials, the, the 20-somethings. And it's interesting, those were the two groups that um, they, they actually report very similar results in terms of, of losing their jobs and needing to go independent from necessity. And, and if you look back at the recession, um, both of those groups just hit it wrong age-wise. The baby boomers were earning a lot, but they were also older, so they, they faced the brunt of a lot of the layoffs. And then the young millennials were just entering the workforce and struggled to find jobs and the inability to find jobs. So those are the two co cohorts that really got whacked um, by the recession. Uh, next slide, please. So I talked earlier a little bit about, about segments and about differences across. And one of the questions that we ask people we asked several ways. We asked them to describe themselves, um, and we asked them to describe themselves getting to pick many different options, all of these options. And then we asked them also to describe themselves, if you just had to pick one, what would best describe who you are? And this is the pick one group. And the, the, the interesting thing for us is, as an industry, we tend to call all of, all of these people, and, and I consider ourselves in this group, of course, as a two-person firm, we tend to call them all freelancers. And, and I use that term all the time myself, too. But when you actually ask people, do you consider yourself a freelancer, they tell you, no, I don't think I'm a freelancer. Um, with some exceptions, the creative professionals um, often consider themselves freelancers, although, as we can see here, more of them think of themselves as creative professionals first. And so when we ask people to self-describe, self-employed consistently is the highest number. And here it's 36% in terms of choose once. Um, when we ask the people to choose many, well over half describe themselves as self-employed. And so as we think about who these folks are and, and how they behave, it's important to remember there are these different segments and they behave a little differently. The one that catches most people off guard is independent contractor professional services, which consistently is the second highest in, in our surveys and other people's surveys. And when we ask them to choose many, it, it, it almost doubles that number. Um, a very high group of people out there see themselves as providing services and professional services in the marketplace and self-identify that way. So as we think about going forward, as you think about this market and this group of people, remember that there are these different segments. Next, please. Hey, hey Steve, before we leave this slide, uh, there's a couple of questions. You know, one uh, I think is, fits into this slide is um, uh, Earl, earlier their question was, what what is included in the temp uh, worker? You know, describe what that means, and I don't know if you want to talk to that. Sure. In, in terms of the temp workers, what, what we actually do is we ask people to self-describe, and we give them some explanations of what these things look like, uh, just a few words. And so these are the people that have said that I work in a temporary uh, capacity, I work as a temporary worker. So. It's mostly um, how people feel about themselves and how they self-describe their work. And so one of the interesting things related to temp workers, you know, the, the temp worker numbers come in at about 3 million overall when, when you sort of look across the different ways people get work and such. But most of the temp workers describe themselves as something else first. I'm a creative professional first and I'm a temporary second. Or I'm a consultant first and I'm a temporary second. And that's why when you look at the temp numbers, they're pretty low um, relative to the style of work is probably closer to about 12% of the population. And oftentimes, Jean, the, the temp is, um, I, I mean, for the most part, we're talking about people who would go through an agency to get 
to get work. And that's um, and there are some prompts in some of our questions that um, that will help to classify it that way. Yeah. yeah, and I'll just add that you know if you look at the actual numbers of population of people in the staffing industry in America, it's it's just about two million people. So you know it pretty much is pretty consistent where at a, out of a population of thirty million, uh, you know seven percent isn't that far off. And there, there's one other thing I think is, is important to point out here because we, we use the term solopreneur a lot in our work and, and here we have entrepreneur as a fairly low number. And one of the things that we find with independent uh, workers is that while they are they're business builders driven by a lifestyle goal, not necessarily a high growth business goal. Some of them are and some of them aren't. But um, but I think that there are some some uh, non revenue number non revenue factors that come into play that are key motivators as we've seen, and that those are how success is measured. So um, so the term entrepreneur does not come up as much when we ask people to self identify. Now that varies culturally. When we do some of this work internationally, that number can be much higher because culturally that's a more acceptable concept than than an independent worker. So uh, it's it's really interesting to uh, to try and work with that around the globe. In terms of of how the independents see themselves and and their plans going forward, we we ask a series of questions around what you're planning on doing in the future, and and it's very it's very consistent data, and this is the fun of four years of data. Um, we find that about 80% consistently, 75 to 80% consistently tell us, I'm either going to stay independent or I'm going to build a bigger business. And the interesting thing to me about the building a bigger business is, you, I think you, we're, we think we're seeing the, the example of the improving economy as it goes from 11% to 15%. In any given year, the difference is not statistically significant. But from 2011 to 2014, you know, we do see a statistical difference, and we think as the economy improved, more people are saying, "Hey, I can expand my business, become an employer business." And one of the important things for our economy is independent workers are the source of most new uh, employer small businesses. Well over half of all employer small businesses in, in America started as single person businesses. And so from a research and economic impact standpoint, it's Im important to notice that. Um, the second piece is the retirement data. Uh, obviously, it's higher for older people. Younger people aren't going to retire. But one of the things that comes out of our work is independent workers, older independent workers, um, like being independents, enjoy their jobs, and they're not looking to retire anytime soon. They're planning that, you know, when you talk to them and we do interviews, they're going to say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down. I might do less work, but most of them want to continue. And so we don't, we don't get a lot of response to the retirement data, even amongst those independent workers that are in their late 60s through uh, early 70s. In fact, 94% uh, of the seniors report um, a satisfaction level of uh, 7 or above, which is just huge. If you're looking at 8 to 10 on the satisfaction level, it's 85%. It's, uh, so, they're liking what they're doing, and you know it might be that it's harder to get another job, and so they like this because it enables them to do what they want to do. But overall, we find a very high satisfaction level with the with the uh, seniors. Next, please. One of the more interesting findings that's come out of this study is around security and risk. We we spend a lot of time trying to understand how independent workers and traditional job holders view risk and security associated with employment because it's such a driver around whether or not people are going to become independent. And one of the biggest shifts is the percentage of people who are actually telling us now they feel more secure being an independent worker than they do if they had a traditional job. And we've seen a steady increase in this over the life of this survey. And, and we didn't ask this specific question, but we asked similar questions back in 06 and 07. And the numbers there were only in the 20% range. And one of the things that's happened, again, goes back to what I mentioned before about economic uncertainty. What people are telling us is they feel more secure because they have multiple sources of income, uh, maybe two or three different kinds of independent businesses, or they have multiple clients, multiple customers. And so their view is, I might lose one customer, but I'm not going to lose my entire livelihood. Um, and then more people are seeing traditional employment as being riskier. 
um, capricious acts by corporate eliminating divisions, uh, mercurial bosses. We hear things like that about, I'm not, I'm not secure in my traditional employment. It's, it's too easy to get laid off. And so this is a pretty fundamental shift in how people are viewing independent work and traditional jobs, and, and we'll continue to track it. Interestingly enough, when we ask people which is riskier, independent workers still consider independent, risk, risk, uh, independent work riskier. Um, but more and more are now seeing it as more secure. Really interesting psychographic differences. Um, next, please. So we, we spend a lot of time, and, and I'm always fascinated with the media and how the media reports on independent work and freelancing and such. You, you either get two types of articles. You get an article that says it's wonderful, or you get an article that says it's awful. And the reason is it's a very nuanced uh, situation with independent work is the reality is it's got advantages, but it also has challenges. And we very consistently hear, as you can see from these numbers, that the biggest challenge is not enough predictable income. Now what's interesting about that number is most independent workers have an income objective and most of them feel they're meeting it. And so we don't often hear not enough income in total, although we obviously do hear that a fair amount. Um, but it's the lack of predictability of income. I, I might have a good month I'm followed by two bad months. That, that is really a, one of the major challenges associated with being independent. Um, the other things that you see about are for planning for retirement is kind of a proxy for saving. And it, it, really is, it really is hard to be a saver when you're an independent worker. Again, going back to this lack of predictable income has people um, people not sure about how to save and how much to put aside for retirement where it can't be easily touched in a traditional program. And so it comes back to kind of the predictable income. And then of course the other big challenges are around uh, marketing themselves, getting that next job, the next pipeline um, is a big one. I wanted to just quickly mention down at the bottom concern about benefits. We, we've seen that all. Um, a lot of that we think is related to the noise and press around the Affordable Care Act. Uh, more popularly known as Obamacare, um, certainly making it uh, easier for individuals to access insurance, um, not always cheaper uh, in terms of, of how that works, but, but um, and we have seen a decline in the number of people who don't have health insurance who are independent workers over the last couple of years. Not a substantial decline, but a decline. So the benefit is getting a little, a little easier, but it's still expensive and hard. Next, please. Good. Steve, before we leave this, we have a couple of questions um, uh, regarding the Affordable Care Act. So question is, you know, what will be the impact of the Affordable Care Act on independent consultants? And do we think that companies will be less interested in independent contractors because of the added liability or cost exposure? Um, you, you could comment on that. I, I've got some thoughts on this as well, but I'll let you uh, answer it first. Yeah, the Affordable Care Act's having some really interesting impacts, we think, and what we've seen so far. And it's still early, of course. But the first one is for independent workers that earn at kind of their, the median income or below the median income that qualify for subsidies, the Affordable Care Act is, is so far proven to be a pretty good thing with some caveats in the sense that they now and get access to stuff they to insurance that they couldn't afford before, and so that's the reason we believe the we've seen the decline in the number of people who don't have health insurance. Um, for independent workers who make more than the median income, uh, one of the problems is increasing rates. Uh, it does get rid of pre-existing conditions, which is a very good thing for independent workers. Um, it does provide some other benefits around being able to put your kids on the, the plan. And so there are some real benefits, um, but what, what's happening is for people who make above the median incomes, many of those people are seeing their rates increase quite a bit, particularly if they had plans that didn't fit under the Affordable Care Act's uh, rules. And, and actually our health insurance went up quite a bit uh, because we had a plan that we loved that was very good, but it didn't fit, and we had to get a new plan, and it was more expensive. But anyway, um, so there's winners and losers with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but I would say the net effect, and when you add in lack of job lock, meaning people can now leave traditional employment and get health insurance um, instead of having to stay in a job and, and because they needed insurance and it, was, and it was hard to get as an individual, 
the overall net effect, I think, is positive. Your, your second question around companies, I think the Affordable Care Act is actually going to lead companies to hire more independent workers um, to avoid all the rigmarole and the potential penalties and the costs of providing their own insurance. So I'm not sure I understand the second question as well. So I'll let you follow up on that, Gene. Okay, Steve. So just to add this one comment to the individual side, and I agree with everything you just said, Steve, is, uh, but in addition, you know, I think anybody that's earning over, you know, forty or fifty thousand dollars a year is going to find that they have to buy insurance that's not necessarily designed for what they want because of the minimal uh, uh, affordable care that's needed now to have any individual coverage. So I think for sure it, you're going to see premiums go up. And to boot on that for independent. Uh, contractors, there's, uh, you know, some tax implications because that now needs to be paid for with after-tax dollars. So uh, if, if, um, uh, if, if you, you know, buy the insurance for, you, for yourself. So I, I do think that for individual um, workers, the Affordable Care Act, uh, once you hit a certain income level, uh, it does create some challenges that I think could be overcome with the proper structure of putting together a um, an appropriate business entity uh, and and be part of you know certain programs that are out there. So so I and I also think there's going to be more types of programs available uh, as as this uh, evolves. As far as the second question in terms of will uh, companies be less interested in independent contractors because of the liability or cost exposure. Uh, I, I agree with you, Steve. I think there will be more independent contractors because companies don't want to deal with the Affordable Care Act and the, and the additional cost. However, if they use independent contractors, which they will probably use more, they do need to be concerned about the reclassification risk because if you use an independent contractor and you don't properly classify them or have the appropriate uh, work arrangements set up so that they are not going to be challenged to be your employee, uh, there, there would be high risk of those individuals being um, uh, causing big penalties if they are reclassified as the employee of the, of the customer. And certainly large companies that use large pools of independent contractors need to be very concerned with having the proper uh, independent contractor engagement programs in place because if those independent contractors do get reclassified as employees of the company which which could uh, uh, which are subject to you know various rules of um, control rules of behavior uh, the way it's arranged not only will they be uh, penalized for providing uh, for having the to provide uh, health care for those employees that were reclassified from their independent contractors, but that could also uh, impact their entire uh, employee base. Mm -hmm. So I guess the word of caution is, yes, there will be more independent contractors, but the importance of engaging them properly with the proper controls and proper uh, classification has just become an extremely important uh, issue now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the message to take away. Yeah, and our, our, our work indicates that in misclassification is just going to be a bigger and bigger issue over the next couple of years. Everybody's getting worked up about it. And there are additional penal definitely additional penalties associated with the Affordable Care Act above the already stiff penalties that, that are in place. And, and we're seeing particularly related to the sharing economy, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, and so forth, just a lot of controversy around misclassification and worker treatment. So expe we expect government to get much stiffer on this than they have in the past. Yes, I'll move to the next slide now, Steve. Um, one of the interesting things we found, we talked about finding clients and, and, and lack of predictable income and trying to figure out how to get new business as being some of the biggest challenges. And, and we've, this, these findings have actually gotten a ton of uh, press and activity uh, uh, reaction over the last few weeks, uh, led off by a Harvard Business Review article on this topic. But um, in general, what we found consistently is independent workers look to word of mouth and, and networks. And that's no great surprise if you study this stuff on a regular basis and if you think through it. But it's the extent to which networks and word of mouth are so important that's so interesting to us. And when you look at this, we asked 
again, we have top methods and many methods, and, when, and this is the top method. And so when you look at top methods, it's just word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, referrals, networks as the key thing. Um, next slide, and I'll talk about the rest of it. Well, actually, just one, one thing on this slide, um, a, a number of you might notice the social media was uh, way down at the bottom of the page. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. So Steve, Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say that there is the best a reputation builder tool. It is not uh, something that actually brings in business. Next slide. So, so when we look at it, about three out of four listed word of mouth is the top method for getting work, and and that's consistent with other surveys and studies we've done, um, and we've done a number of them over the years. We just consistently hear that. What's in what makes it even more interesting is that the what we consider the high earning people, the 100K plus group, um, even consider referrals even more important than the average independent worker. And in this case, this year, 84% actually listed at number one. And what's also, we did a study earlier this year with MBO um, looking at, at another definition of successful independence based a little bit, on, based partially on income and length of service. And we got the exact same numbers. And so what you're seeing is it's, it really is about the networks. And I, and I wanted to expand on what Carolyn was saying about social media and also online marketplaces. Social media comes in very low as only 2 to 3% is the primary method. But, um, but when we ask, about 35% of the people do say they use social media in their business. Um, they use it for branding. They use it to help build reputation. But when you ask them, does social media directly lead to revenue, uh, people tend to say, or prospects and clients, uh, independent workers tend to tell us no, and and we're a good example of that in our business. We do use social media on a regular basis. Uh, every day we're doing social media stuff, but I but to this you know we, and we've been doing it for years, and to this day I've yet to actually believe I've gotten a specific client due to our social media activities. Um, it certainly reinforces what we do, and so we're not against social media. We we think social media is a great thing. Um, but it just doesn't lead directly to clients in most cases. Online marketplaces, sort of the Elances and Odesks and Freelancer.coms and those guys, um, we find about 20% of the people overall say they use them. Um, it's a very, it, very few people use them as their primary source. When you look at who's using them as their primary source of business, it's, it's uh, younger people or new people that, that haven't really established their traditional networks to get business. And so they're using the online talent marketplaces as a way to get going and as a way to establish themselves more than anything else. Um, this last year, we started tracking the sharing economy, uh, collaborative economy sites like the Ubers and the Airbnbs and people like that. And, and that's still a nascent industry, but it, but it actually blipped, which is, which is interesting for, for a small industry so far. It gets a lot of press. Um, but um, those things, again, for most people, uh, TaskRabbit is seen as a secondary source of income, not a primary a source of uh, income and jobs. So, you know, again, it's, it's networks, networks, networks. And Gene, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I know, Steve, this is really interesting and certainly consistent with everything we see. I mean, certainly the more career-minded independent workers who are really trying to build themselves their own independent business, uh, it, in, and are doing more um, strategic work or, more, or, or work that is of larger uh, engagement size in terms of dollars uh, uh, are, are, are finding their work based on uh, references or word of mouth or, or relationships, uh, former employers, um, uh, obviously client referrals. And I, I think, you know, like you said, the social media is, is great for um, marketing your, your skills, uh, developing thought leadership. Uh, it's great for exposure and branding, but when it gets down to getting work, it, it is about um, uh, that trust of, of someone referring you. And uh, it's very consistent with what we find in our community. And in terms of the, the, um, you know, the online marketplaces, I think they're great for uh, you know, smaller tactical work. Um, you know, if you have, uh, uh, if you're a company and you're and you need something done that is uh, of of um, 
you know, may, maybe not necessarily strategic, and you don't really need to know the person who's doing it, you'll go online and and, and you'll you know risk uh, you know five hundred to a couple thousand dollars to get something done. But when you're looking at doing something that's a little bit more strategic, or you know, talking about a ten, fifteen, thirty, hundred thousand dollar project, you're not going to do that with someone you don't know. So it, it is. Uh, um, you know, a, a really interesting uh, observation, which I also think is important to um, people to know who are considering going off and being an independent. It's about your network, and it's about being able to articulate your expertise. And, you know, I always like to say, uh, if you're going to become an independent worker and leaving a, a traditional job, um, you really need to be really careful about how you're exiting uh, make sure you don't burn bridges. Uh, I believe that the way to think about it is, you know, you want to turn your employer into your client, and and think about it that way. And and th those are probably where you get uh, your first set of real, true, uh, strong, independent work arrangements is through uh, former employers or people that know you and and trust you. So um, I, I I I you know, the the research was was uh, confirming our anecdotal beliefs of, of what we see in our community. Okay. I'm just going to summarize this real quick so we can scoot through and, and have time for questions. But we did find in our research that we've got about uh, half women and half men showing up in, in, in the independent workforce. It's a very um, egalitarian place in that, in that way. And that's been fairly consistent. It kind of ebbs and flows a little bit around the 50-50 mark. But it holds right in there. Um, and the, the biggest difference, well, you know, overall the attitudes towards independence are very similar. There are two areas where it differs by gender. And basically, women see independence as a path to fulfilling work um, that fits their lifestyle. Lifestyle is very important. Flexibility is very important. Um, and men tend to want to be their own boss and make the most money. So when, when we break down those, um, the categories by gender, those are the two biggest differences we see. And we can get you these slides and the data for anybody that's interested in that. Next slide. So independents have quite a big impact on our economy, about $1.1 trillion uh, in total revenue across the way. And when you look at their contribution to our household income, over 10 million U.S. households get at least half their income from uh, independent work, and that's about one out of every 12 U.S. households. And if you drop it down to about 25% or more of their income, it's about one in eight U.S. households get about 25% uh, or more of their income from independent work, so substantial uh, economic impact. Uh, the number of 100K earners, a, a metric we talk, we track as, as, as our high earner group, um, continues to grow very rapidly um, and is up to 2.7. Next slide, please. And continuing with the economic impact, um, not only do, does it generate a lot of household income, but independent workers hire a lot of other independent workers. And what we found in our 2014 research is that they spent, independent workers spent about $96 billion hiring 2.3 million equivalent full-time workers um, via contract hiring. And so they're not just a source of, of income, but they're a source of employment. And we're seeing more and more independents shift to this model, and more and more businesses have shifted to this model of collaborating and hiring other contract workers instead of traditional employees. So this is part of the structural shift that we see going on um, in our economy towards independent work. Um, next, please. It's interesting to look at, um, one of the things we like to look at is, is non-independent workers and their interest in becoming an independent worker. And this helps us with our forecasting work about what's going to happen with this in the future. And, and as a rule of thumb, it's really interesting. About 12 to 14 percent of Americans at any point in time will tell you they're interested in becoming an independent worker and or starting a very small business. Um, and we see that in this data. We see it in other survey data. There's a project out of Boston, uh, Babson College, called the Global Economic Monitor. Uh, that asks this question in a very different way, but comes back to about 12 to 14 percent of the people saying that interested in doing this work. So, so we definitely see this as a good rule of thumb. Um, when you talk about 12 or four, 12 to 14 percent, probably will or definitely will. We're surveying adult Americans, and there's 230 million of them, 21 and older, 
Um, so you end up with numbers in the 27 to 28 million that are telling us that they want to do this. Uh, and our question we ask over the next two years. It, when you ask a question like this, you tend to get uh, a lot of false positives. People are aspirational. Oh, yeah, I'm going to start a business. And then they don't do it. We actually dive in a little deeper and look at things like who's start opening bank accounts, who's developing websites, who's getting tax IDs. And we use that to do our forecast. And that's why, based on these numbers, why our forecast goes to 24.5 million of the uh, solopreneurs out, out, uh, out in 2019, because we see so many people um, pursuing independence. Next slide, please. The other interesting piece that comes out of this research is how non-independent workers view um, being out on their own and being independent. And, and one of the fascinating things is they basically have the correct view of what independent work is, that the positives are control, flexibility, being their own boss, do what I love. And the negatives, they come across very well. And so non-independent workers have a really good view of what's going on. The big difference is their view of how risky it is. Non-independent workers consider independent work much, much riskier than independent workers do. And the other interesting factor is the people that are considering becoming independent, they consider it less risky than the people who say, I'm not going to become independent. And so a lot of this has to do around your views of risk, security, and risk reward. And so a large chunk of our population um, believes that this is simply too risky. The second piece is, um, have the money to invest, have to invest their own money. I'm, I'm fascinated by this response because starting an independent work, our research shows most independent workers start their business with less than $5,000. But there's a real concern out there by non-independents about risking their own money um, to start a business. So it, so it comes back to this sort of risk and security piece. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that there's challenges with independence. And just as there are challenges, independence is not working for everybody. Um, we consistently, across our work for years, we found that there is a large chunk of people, about 30%, 25%, 33%. This is a harder thing to get at, the people that are unhappy um, being independent workers. And, and primarily, it comes down to a couple things. Uh, it's that they didn't choose independence. It's that they lack autonomy, control, and flexibility in their work. Um, and they feel very insecure and very much at risk. And we're seeing that um, basically when you see people that have been hired and they almost have all the disadvantages of traditional jobs and, and none of the benefits, meaning job security and health benefits and so forth, and at the same time, they don't have any of the benefits of being independent, flexibility, control, and autonomy. And so there is a group of people out there that are unhappy with it. Um, and it's clear that it's not for everybody. Next, please. And so for the folks that it is, what we found is the people that are out there that are happy with it and succeeding, there's some, there's some clear success factors. I, you know, choice is a big one. And, and it's kind of a retroactive one. But the people who choose being independent, tend to be very happy with it, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a second piece is sort of seeing themselves as running a business and having, um, and having the skills to do so. And, and that, that can be done through education. It doesn't just have to be done, um, it doesn't have to be done through natural skills. Um, and then, of course, the ability to deal with the uncertainty and the lack of security and having the confidence to do it. And so we see these clear success factors running through uh, the entire study, and it's really interesting. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Am I still on? Yes. Can you not see it, Steve? Oh, there we go. It just took a minute to update, I guess. Um, going forward, uh, one of the things that's really interesting is you study what's going on with the independent workforce and you study the future, future of work is there's a convergence of trends happening. Um, and it's a number of different trends. And we consistently in our work, when we see a convergence of trends, we know something big is happening because they reinforce one another. They help one another. And in the case of the independent workforce, we're seeing demographic and social shifts and a desire for greater work-life flexibility driving this. Millennials are, are becoming more interested. Aging boomers, baby boomers are looking for alternative ways to work. So we, we kind of see 
the social and demographic trends. The technology is certainly making it easier. There's a growing support infrastructure. MBO Partners is an example of that, but the online talent marketplaces, the software that makes it easy to do, cloud computing makes it easy to interact with customers, a whole range of things going on. And then, of course, we haven't talked about it much in this, but companies are shifting to hiring independent workers into contingent workers. And we're seeing a, a pronounced uh, growth in, in the use of, of independent workers and contingents by companies. And then, of course, um, it continues to be hard to find good jobs. So when you pull all of this together, it's clear to us that we, are, we have seen a structural shift. We are seeing, we will see the continued growth of the in, independent workforce as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm now, we're, we still got a few minutes left and um, yeah, happy we, we we have a couple of minutes, Steve, and you know, um, I, I, there's a lot of questions here. We're not going to be able to get to all of them because uh, you know we, we promised that we'll conclude on the hour. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, for anybody that wants you know more information, uh, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to either you know email uh, email me at you know gene at mbopartners.com or just you know reach out to us on our website. And also, you know, we'll put a little, uh, uh, you could just elect um, to, to select uh, that you want more information. So with that, I'm going to just uh, see if we could cover maybe two or three questions here. Uh, so Steve, one question is, um, were there differences between the genders and or age groups regarding their interest level in becoming independent? So of those uh, that we talked about with their interest levels, what, do you, do you recall any differences between either gender or age level uh, in terms of their interest level? Yeah, you, you get the interest level is pretty high across the board, but the two groups, um, millennials, are, are, are very interested. They may or may not act on it, but they're extremely interested in becoming independent. And then at the older baby boomer group are the two groups. And, and it's not surprising, the older baby boomers are kind of wearing out on working for the man. and thinking about encore careers and partial retirement or doing something different. And the millennials are just the age group that likes control. Um, and then the, the middle-aged people, the folks that are in sort of the child, you know, 30 to 50, um, there's still high interest, but it's low relative to the other groups. And, and that's sort of when security uh, of employment becomes more important. So is those two groups. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we got one minute left. We'll see if we get to answer one more question here. Um, uh, one person is asking, uh, is there um, any, any data that uh, shows how m much, in terms of dollars, independents spent on self-training, uh, either to enhance their skills or to learn more about how to better market their business when we talked about the money they spent? Do we have any detail on that? Oh gosh, we don't. That's an awfully good question and something we can add, add to the survey next add year. Next year. Add the, we, but we, we do not have that data. And, and I'm not familiar with anybody who's collected that data on independent workers. One, one thing I will say is that independent workers are absolute wizards at finding um, free sources of education. And so I'm not sure dollars spent is necessarily uh, and, and, um, the right the right measure for trying to figure out um, how much they're taking in. Yeah, time might be a better measure. So we're going to conclude by going to ask you one more question, Steve. So uh, it's uh, Halloween in uh, 2014. Uh, what do you think the uh, American workforce will look like Halloween 2020? Well, in 2020, we think roughly 40 to somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the workforce will be independent in some form. Um, it, the numbers now are based on where we are now. It's I'd say in the the low to mid 40s, 43 to 46. Um, so the the workforce continues to shift, and it continues to shift in in this direction. Um, that's not very far away, though. It's only six years away. So uh, we'll we'll have to wait and see. In our in our world, that's not very far out. Well, Carolyn and Steve, this was certainly a treat, and uh, thanks very much for your time to share the research that uh, I think has been pretty important for the uh, uh, a lot of thought leaders in the industry and the, and the economists. So with that, I want to thank the audience, and we had a lot of people on the line. There's a lot of questions. We're going to try to get answers to you. But um, with that, have a great day, great Halloween, and uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.